Massachusetts voters will decide in a November 3rd ballot question if the state should embrace a ranked choice voting system for almost all federal and state races starting in 2022. Critics say the system is confusing and complicated. Kerry Saldo spoke with UMass Amherst professor Justin Gross, a ranked choice supporter, for his perspective. You know, it's been in the works for a while, um, especially in New England, certain other parts of the country, Southwest, um, but actually in Massachusetts itself, um, we have one of the earlier, earliest examples in Cambridge uh, since 1941 of um, using ranked choice uh, voting in certain um, local elections. And so I think that there's um, some openness to it here. Um, so I, I wasn't shocked, but I, I think it's, an, it's interesting to have it before the, the voting public. Yeah, and it has popped up here and there across the country. We'll talk about that. It's used overseas, some, some places almost exclusively but still a bit of a mystery for folks here. So I want to have us break that down. So ranked choice voting in essence kind of is what it seems like. People are ranking their voter, their preference in order. We'll give an example here. We'll go with cookies, chocolate chip, peanut butter, oatmeal, raisin. I'm all over the chocolate chip. That's where I am headed. But if that doesn't come out on top, if there isn't a definitive majority winner, what then happens in ranked choice voting? Whether it's cookies right. or actual candidates. One of the problems is that especially as you have more options available, perhaps chocolate chip will be popular enough that you'll get over 50%. And we have some general sense that if there is a majority winner, that should be the winner. That's the case here too. If any one uh, nominee gets 50% uh, or more in the first round, uh, that's a majority. But the more options there are, I'll give you an example of um, the California gov gubernatorial recall election that eventually uh, uh, pulled out Governor Gray Davis and resulted in uh, Schwarzenegger as governor. Um, in that uh, election, that recall election, there were like 200 options, right? And so potentially, if it's just plurality, if it's just first past the post, it, it, now it so happened that Schwarzenegger was well not, known enough and got enough support that it didn't seem ridiculous. But in principle, you could have someone, if you had 200 candidates, you could have the choice nom nominee having like four or 5%. And so that generally does, wouldn't sit well, especially if they were really low on, on most people's charts. So the way it works is basically if no one candidate, uh, say chocolate chip cookies, makes it past 50%, um, there's a sort of um, instant runoff. Um, and some places actually call it instant runoff in some versions of this. And the first thing that happens is uh, whichever candidate got the least first place votes would be eliminated. So say oatmeal cookies, sorry, grandma, <laughs> oatmeal raisin cookies maybe was had the least first place votes. Those votes would be eliminated. And anyone who had oatmeal cookies as their first choice or anyone had the eliminated candidate first, we would look at their second choice and their uh, votes would be moved accordingly. And this would be repeated until one candidate gets above 50% of the vote. Now, opponents say that it's a very complicated system. And what you just described, while can be very streamlined and obviously can end up with someone coming out on top, opponents say it's too complicated. Is that part of what has kept this out of wider use outside of Cambridge, the example you gave earlier? I think the sort of uh, fears of complication sometimes are just it's... Um, discomfort with what's new. Um, I think that people are used to just seeing, uh, they have this sense of like, this is the way um, voting works. And it's actually uh, not in fact, um, uh, a uh, this kind of plurality vote where whoever gets the most regardless, whether it's um, above 50% uh, is um, not very popular among those who study social choice or how we actually, it's not a straightforward matter to say, hey, who's the choice of the crowd? Um, and actually, it, you know, um, ranked choice does um, bring in more nuanced idea of how uh, individuals can express their choice. Uh, another option is uh, that some places use is just having a runoff and um, that's more expensive. So, and also doesn't uh, allow for as much uh, nuance. And, and some of the same problems that happen with um, just plurality can happen with uh, instant runoff as well. Uh, just as a quick example, in Peru in 2011, I believe their presidential election had maybe five candidates, five or six candidates. And two of them that wound up in the runoff um, were a far left candidate, Umala, and uh, Keiko Fujimori on the right. Um, when you asked all of the voters at that time, like who are their least favorite candidates, those two were the least favorite. So basically the middle, the center right and center left, who all would have preferred someone else to those candidates, um, we're splitting their vote. And that's one of the things that ranked choice also tries to avoid is vote splitting, wasted votes. And, um, you know, you'd have a number of situations if you had ranked choice vote, um, say, Nader not 
uh, affecting the vote in Florida in the uh, presidential uh, election in 2000. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, um, Maine, where there has been uh, adopted ranked choice voting, one of the reasons that um, what prompted that was uh, Paul LePage's, Governor LePage's victory. Uh, he essentially had uh, something like 37.6% in uh, his first election in 2010 and more moderate candidates than him uh, would easily have, easily have beaten him, uh, it's believed, in, based on polling in a, in a uh, instant runoff or ranked choice voting situation. You mentioned some of the snags that have prompted this process. And Michael Meehan, the, the uh, of Voter Choice for Massachusetts, which is the campaign that pushed to get this item on the ballot before voters here in Massachusetts in November, said this, quote, this is a simple, fair, and effective way to address so many of the political ills that we all complain about at the dinner table. Some other political ills that you see that this might remedy? One of the complaints you often hear from folks is the lack of choice. And um, among political scientists, there's a well-known um, uh, property, a principle called Duverger's Law that emerged from a French sociologist in the mid 20th century that basically says when you have this kind of plurality voting, non-proportional, non-ranked choice voting, um, it necessarily or almost necessarily leads to uh, two dominant parties. And so for anyone who wants sort of more variety, um, there's, there's a reason that um, the Libertarian Party of Massachusetts also supports this as well as the Dem Democratic Party of Massachusetts. You know, one of the ways is it, you know, it allows those who just can't bring themselves to vote for the lesser of two evils in their mind and really want to cast a vote for, say, Libertarian or Green Party or maybe some new party that emerges, they can do that. And then if that party turns out, that candidate turns out to be last, they still get to cast another vote. They don't have to just waste a symbolic vote. They can kind of do both things. In the long run, that can also help things because a fledgling party that might only get a few percent but is still getting attention um, can build and you have more of a chance that there's um, uh, more of a multi-party system in the long run. But were this to be enacted, what other changes? I mean, to me, initially, a debate pops to mind. We've had very, very, very crowded debate stages, especially at the presidential level as of late in the primary process. Does this then make that even more complicated and broader? So no. So I'm glad you brought that up. And, and interestingly, and I think unfortunately from a perspective of someone who supports ranked choice voting, uh, the current ballot would not, um, it would be for most uh, um, uh, offices, certainly state offices, local offices, in the most part, and federal co congressional offices, but not for the president as it stands and not for the presidential primary. I actually think the primary is one of the places where this is um, best used, and it was uh, attempted for the first time recently by the Democratic parties um, in Alaska, Hawaii, Kansas, and Wyoming. Um, it didn't really, it was late in the game, so we got more, there was more than 50% went to Biden. But I mean, if you think about it, when you had, in fact, in the 2016 election, there were 17 uh, Republican nominees. Um, when individuals were asked early on, like who they, who they approved and disapproved of, uh, the eventual president nominee and President Trump, had some of the highest disapproval ratings. But when you have 17 candidates, this is a situation in which a strong group that supports them, so early on, you know, it was in the teens and then 20, 25%, even if everyone else put him last, and I'm not saying that was the case, but um, someone with name recognition can really make a splash. And so I think actually with many candidates, that's exactly a situation where you'd want ranked choice. And I should point out that it doesn't mean you have to rank all of them. So, in, and in this ballot initiative, again, it doesn't apply to presidential or primaries, um, but if you had multiple candidates, you could just put your first vote in and say, you know, after that, I don't care. It would be the equivalent of if there's a runoff, not including my favorite, I'm not going. Um, you could rank your first three, four, five, or all of them. Um, and, you know, essentially that uh, amounts to anyone I leave off, I don't know much about them, and it's equivalent. I will say one thing on, uh, as a, a, um, a point that the, um, say, the Mass Fiscal Alliance, who's opposing this ballot brings up, um, that's a, a reasonable objection, I think, um, is that in, in the case, they say, look, if you want this, if you want to do better than plurality, let's just have a runoff. Uh, again, that's ex that could be expensive, but the reason that they bring up that they like it is, that it's just hard, you know, the ways in which it's confusing is not simply um, on the ballot. And I think that there'd need to be an education campaign to prepare people to vote. Um, but it's also in terms of trying to think about mm, who I prefer among all of these. And something about a, a runoff between two, the two leaders um, would force voters to say, okay, 
I had my pick and now they didn't, they're not in the final two. Let me think carefully about these two head to head instead of trying to order all at once. So there are definitely trade-offs um, and I guess we'll see what the voters think. And another objection that might be coming if this were to be a passed and approved, there's going to need to be money attached to it because as someone who's covered elections for a long time in small communities, city clerks and volunteers make election night happen. So if this is a more detailed process, you're going to need more brains and more bodies behind this, and that probably is going to cost money. Who pays for that? Well, yeah, so there, there would need to be obviously money attached to it. I think, um, you know, on the other hand, we've seen places where it's adopted a, a lot more voter turnout, a lot more interest. Um, we'll, you know, um, have, have to see the, I think, uh, along with the, the added uh, work, I think some money that needs to be attached, as I said, to just educating um, voters and, and finding a ballot that actually there are ways to do this on a ballot that are confusing and ways that are less confusing. And so figuring out maybe, you know, test running some uh, options uh, out there. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be important that if this gets passed, that they commit to it. Um, certainly in some, some places, most places that have adopted it have kept it. Um, there are certainly places that have actually adopted it and then gone back. Sometimes there's buyer's remorse. So I'll give you an example, uh, Burlington, Vermont. Uh, used it for its mayoral election 2005-2009. Um, what wound up happening, uh, and then it was repealed by a small margin, and now folks are, are pushing to have it back. But what, what happened essentially was um, you had four main candidates for mayor. Uh, there was a progressive who was uh, the incumbent, uh, sort of further to the left than the Democrat. So there was a progressive, a Democrat, a Republican, and an independent. And the Republican in the first round got 30 point, uh, sorry, 32.9%. Um, uh, the uh, Democrat, or sorry, the, the, the progressive had 28.8, just a few behind. And so then there, were, there was another round, the Republican stayed ahead. And in the third round, the progressive, basically all the Democrats, once the Democrat was out, many of them voted for the progressive. And so the progressive, eat, you know, eat that a win. And so that sort of situation sometimes sets up uh, complaints of, you know, no fair, feeling like, oh, we're so close to, to winning. And then all of a sudden, in a later round, someone else won. So it certainly takes psychologically uh, an understanding and an ad adaptation to uh, a richer idea of what um, public choice is than just sort of, I cast my one vote and then that's it. And it actually winds up involving people more in the full process, right? So if they cast for someone who's not even, you know, credible, they, they don't have to make that choice strategically. Um, subsequently, uh, they can go through it. But yes, it'll, it'll certainly take money to do. As the ballot question reads and that people will be looking at in November to make this decision, if they support ranked choice voting, this would be rolled out by 2022. That seems pretty brisk, no? Yeah, although, uh, yes, that, that's consistent with how it's been done uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, at the, the state level, it's a bigger state. I think it'll be a challenge. There haven't been a, a, a lot of states, and Maine is obviously smaller. Um, a number of, um, that's basically the pace. Uh, two, two localities recently adopted it for their uh, local elections, um, uh, East Hampton and uh, Amherst. I guess it's it's a bit easier, you know, they have a, a two-year ske uh, schedule, it's a bit easier, but in some cases it's actually more complicated, at least in this case, I believe all the elections um, we're dealing with here are single winner. Uh, some places like um, Cambridge, as I mentioned, and, and Amherst with uh, uh, town council um, will be multiple, and that's sort of a generalization, an extension of the notion of ranked choice voting, where you're actually getting multiple winners out of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that um, if this gets passed, uh, they'll be moving quickly to uh, work on enacting it. And, um, you know, the, the, I think if the um, voters are behind it, uh, and it certainly seems like it's not going to get a, a, a huge amount of pushback by some of the institutional powers in the state, um, they'll be able to do it. I think that actually implementing it will be less challenging than, again, having it go smoothly so that, you know, if, if people aren't expecting it and aren't educated about what it means and how to handle it, then the last thing you want, if you're a supporter of this ballot initiative, is to have it um, be a clunky, confusing rollout. Um, and, uh, and, and then again, you know, maybe if that happens a couple of years later, people are calling for a repeal.